Hi, I'm Jay Edden. And I'm Miles Stokes. And we're the hosts of Jay and Miles Explain the X-Men, a weekly podcast all about the ins, the outs, and the retcons of comics' greatest superhero soap opera. We're also the hosts of Jay and Miles Review the X-Men. Which you're watching right now. Where we talk about the X-Books that come out each week. This week we've got the books of February 15th, 2017. Let's go. First up, we have Uncanny X-Men number 18, written by Colin Bunn, with pencils by Edgar Salazar, inks by Ed Tadeo, and colors by Rain Barreto. So this is yet another Inhumans vs. X-Men tie-in, of course, because all the team books are right now. And it does what I really like tie-in books to do for events, which is that it showcases a look at a character reacting to the events that are going on that teaches us something new about them. And in this case, it's not a character I was expecting. Right. Uh, the focal character in this issue is Shen Zorn, who we've, whom we've seen relatively little of. Um, I think his convoluted background makes him a character writers have been reluctant to do much with. Mm-hmm. And, and again, he seems to fit best often in stories like this that are sort of one-offs. Um, from his perspective. Right, and I, I like that Shen Zorn's back. I like that Colin Bunn isn't shying away from probably one of the most confusing X-Men characters, because the fact of the matter is, Zorn in Grant Mor- Morrison's run, before, you know, the big thing that turned out to be the case with him, was one of my favorite X-Men characters of all mm-hmm. time. So even though Shen Zorn isn't exactly the same version, even though to explain what his relationship is to the original Zorn is to basically do our podcast again from scratch. Well, I mean, we did a cold open about them once. We did, but it was very brief. Yeah. Like, it's, it's a good move to bring the character back and and showcasing the character's philosophy you know trying to be a being of peace in this world of bigotry and hatred and war and in this case literal war in the inhumans x-men mm-hmm. war is a really cool way to uh to look at kind of the the philosophical cost as well as the cost in life and in well-being yeah in some ways it's a study in the cost of pacifism mm-hmm. in the face of aggression that there are contexts in which responding to violence pacifistically results in more harm and more loss of life than responding with force would, which is one of those difficult moral conundrums, but a solidly, you know, practical one to work over, and and one that that I think is really well suited to this character. What did you think of the the art team on this one? The art team really worked for me. Um, I mean, we've seen a couple of artists on this book before. We've seen, of course, Greg Land. We've seen Ken Lashley. Um, I like Lashley better than Land, certainly, but I gotta say, if this artist, if Salazar were an ongoing artist for Uncanny, I would be completely okay with that. I think that the art team in general works really well together. The colors are really strong, too. And Mm -hmm. one of our potential panels of the week, um, which didn't end up winning out, but really highlighted that. It's really, really good use of of color for mood, especially in this issue. Totally, yeah. So, yeah, we have a good character study here. We have a character study, uh, perhaps even more importantly, that fits the title it's in very well. Like, this is in Uncanny X-Men, which is to say the current version of X-Force, for a reason. That's a book that's all about pacifism versus violence, proactive, kind of immoral acts prevent worse acts later on it's a good fit for it i dug it a lot also sebastian shaw as a moral foil for shen zorn good freaking choice somebody who's been all about absolute power not caring about the particulars in fact zorn even calls him out on you know basically that that shaw didn't even care about mutants until caring about them gave him an excuse to fight a bunch of people that's good stuff it actually reminded me in a way of the vosh wolfwood conflict from trigun like their sort of philosophical conflict even if it plays out almost the opposite way in that there is one of them who tends to be less all all holds barred pacifistic than the other. Yeah, otherwise, I, I don't think that's a particularly accurate analogy. Well, I was thinking more of a Paragon Renegade thing, but to go into more would spoil all of Trigon, which I shouldn't do because it's a good anime and you should see it. But regardless. Uh, so, yeah, good solid tie-in. I mean, this book's going to be ending pretty soon, but if it indeed ends with issues like this, that's a pretty strong note to go out on. Our second book this week is not in Humans vs. X-Men tie-in. It is Old Man Logan number 18, written by Jeff Lemire, with art by Andrea Sorrentino and colors by Marcello Maiolo. This wraps up the Brood storyline, and it pushes the book into what looks like it's going to be con- its concluding arc, arc in a way in a direction that's awfully satisfying. I've mentioned before that I tend to like Old Man Logan best by far and away when it's doing genre stories. And the way that this particular one, this this very, very aliens and brood so- or alien and brood saga inflected horror story, segues into and eventually connects to the larger narrative of Old Man Logan, leaves me really optimistic about the ending. 
Yeah, although actually, uh, Old Man Logan is still an ongoing. It's not ending with Resurrection. It and All New Wolverine are both going to continue, in theory, indefinitely. I mean, we'll see how long they actually last, but certainly past Resurrection. Well, in that case, and assuming that it goes in the direction it's going, the end of the first major, major large arc of mm-hmm. Logan, of, of, totally. of Logan displaced to the, the normal not 616 Earth. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of the, the genre homage, this throws in what's absolutely necessary in the genres it's, it's homaging and playing on, which is a twist, and it works at that twist really, really well. Yeah, it's totally different um, yeah. than what I was expecting. I was positive I knew exactly what was going on. Yeah, it wasn't that thing. I mean, it wasn't that I mean, it was off, that thing. It was but... partly that thing. Well, I was... I was expecting uh, Logan's visions to be similar to the visions he had in the original Brood Saga, like, for the same reason. And that's not the case. They're not entirely not for that reason, but Mm. it's complicated. (laughs) And it's interestingly complicated, and it's complicated in ways that bring back a supporting character whose previous presence in this book was, was, to both of our surprise, a, a really good addition to it, which is Teenage Jean Grey. Yeah, I mean, it seemed, like, almost too easy to take this uh, star-crossed, uh, violent, hairy romance um, from the original continuity between Wolverine and Jean, and then to have, like, a grandpa Wolverine and a teenage Jean, that just seemed like a recipe Awkward. for creepy, but it really works. Yeah, no, really I mean, even said so in the comic. He was, he was right. fairly upfront about nice it. Nice little frozen lampshade there. Yeah, yeah so this is this a January-December relationship? <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, so, and, and again, it continues to not go in that direction, which I continue to appreciate. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's solid. Sorrent- Sorrentino and Melo, for their parts, are just killing it this arc. Oh, so I mean, I, I feel like this is the story they've been waiting to draw. Um, and honestly, the story this creative team's been waiting to tell. Like, there's there's so much cohesion. There's that, you know, terrific, terrific art and writing alchemy that, that, that's been absent from, from this team a lot. And like, something has clicked this arc. Yeah. And I mean... it's, it's continuing in pace. And I really hope they can maintain it going forward. So, Miles, what's our issue of the week? So we went back and forth on this one because both issues are super solid, but I think we're going to have to go with Uncanny X-Men number 18. It's a solid done-in-one about a character we don't see enough of and ties in thematically really well to the event it's a spinoff of and the title it takes place in. Basically, it's firing on all cylinders, so gotta love it. Also, uh, bonus points for doing something interesting with Zorn. Yes, absolutely true. Always appreciated. What about our panel? Our panel of the week is this splash from Old Man Logan. Oh, yes. And it's a beautiful page, but more importantly, it does something that a lot of artists try to do and is very, very hard to do well, which is elegant, visually useful, and expressive depiction of telepathy. This is someone dismant- This is a telepath dismantling a hive mind, um, and it works. It works really well, and it's pretty far from anything we've seen in that vein before. Um, so yeah, props for creativity and props for visual narrative. And check out the awesome little monster sounds that are all part of the branching tree telepathy thing. Ah, oh, so good. That's it for this week. Thanks for watching. If you like what you've seen here, but would vastly prefer it without our faces, check out the podcast, Jay and Miles Explain the X-Men. New episodes go up every Sunday at explainthexmen.com, also on Google Play, iTunes, and Stitcher. What have we got for them this week, Miles? So this time we are going back to New Mutants for the very brief status quo of Cable and the New Mutants running around and being an adventuring team before the Extinction Agenda, before X-Force. I kind of wish it had lasted longer. It's got some problems, but we had a lot of fun talking about it. Also, Cable fights Wolverine, which may be the most manly event ever recorded on in a comic. Oh god, each individual bicep and pectoral are having their own smaller fights to make up the bigger one. It's really impressive. That podcast, these video reviews, and everything at explainthexmen.com, including our upcoming convention appearances, will be at Emerald City Comic Con um, in just a couple of weeks. Details coming and forthcoming and on the website, but it's going to be awesome and amazing. We're going to have a party and a live panel and brand new uh, buttons and t-shirts, and it'll be great. Um, are brought to you by our Patreon subscribers. We are an entirely listener-supported project. Those are the folks who keep us on the air and 100% ad-free. And if you'd like to join their ranks, which you totally should, you can do that either above or below this video, depending on where you're watching. In the meantime, as we all frantically prepare for conventions, we will see you in a week with a couple more X-Books. Take care. We couldn't think of anything funny for a tag, so um, here's the blanket I'm netting. It's pretty big. It's got cables but not like that.